Okay, good morning, everybody. Nice to be here. Um, you can probably tell from my accent I'm not from Texas. I'm not even from the US. I uh, traveled in from Dublin yesterday. Uh, Tomás O'Leary is my name. Tomás is uh, Gaelic or Irish for Thomas. And you guys are used to saying awesome. All the Americans say awesome, so that's how you pronounce the last part of my name, okay? You can say Tomásum if you want. Okay, so it's very nice to be here. Thank you very much, Alexander, for the kind invitation. Um, it's exciting uh, to be here to share with you uh, some personal experiences and some technical experiences. Um, I'm going to introduce the Passive House concept, a little bit of overlap with what Wolfgang Feist had mentioned earlier. And, um, but the more time you, you uh, throw mud at a wall, the more likely that mud is to stick. At least that's what we say back at home. Um, I should say Passive House is not a religion for me. It's a really good concept. It makes an awful lot of sense. And uh, we'll, I'd like to see by the end of the, the next three days what you all think of it. By the way, who, who in this room here, if you could just show, have a show of hands, who of you, are, are you familiar with Passive House? If you could show your hand. Okay. Very good. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, a little bit of a history lesson. This is a 5,000 year old building. Uh, it's about an hour from where I live in Ireland. And um, the, uh, our forefathers were very clever. They knew how to manipulate sun. They had no PHPP software or iPads or iPods or anything, anything like that. But they knew how to, uh, how to celebrate the sun on the shortest day of the year. So if you put your name down in about 20 years' time, you might get to experience this. Uh, it's about a 100-foot deep chamber. And on the shortest day of the year, the sun actually meanders up along that chamber and illuminates a central room. This was 5,000 years ago. Okay, so I mean, what we're talking about here today is so common sense, so basic, so fundamental that it, it's, it's sort of ridiculous we're here talking about it. But we are anyway, so let's enjoy the experience. Um, this is uh, where it all started for me. I was in a venue like yourselves here uh, 10 years ago, in fact, 10 years and a couple of months' time, and I stumbled across the Passive House idea. I got up from the table like you're, where you're sitting now, and I phoned my wife, and I said, We're selling our house. And she said, what are you talking about? I said, um, I just came across this passive house idea. We've got to build one. We've got to move, like ASAP. And two years later, we were, we were living in this house. Um, I didn't realize at the time, but it, it turns out it's one of the first passive houses in the English-speaking world. And uh, we're living there since 2004. And our total um, heating and hot water bill uh, for a year is about $320. You could probably spend that on a nice meal out with a... With, uh, with four people for dinner. So it puts things in, into perspective. Um, Wolfgang Feist talked there about the whole education model. Um, there's uh, lots of opportunities now to learn about Passive House. I guess today we're sort of somewhere in between the Passive House primer and the Passive House consultant level. But there's a whole journey you can take, and I'm learning every day. I'm sure Berthold is learning every day as well, and Wolfgang Feist is learning every day. We haven't come to the end yet, uh, not at all, and uh, we're going to learn a lot here. Uh, from you uh, guys as well. So it's a 20 year old concept. It applies to any building and if I had a dollar for every time I s somebody said we really should change the name Passive House you know because it implies it's only applicable to house I wouldn't be here right now I'd be on a yacht somewhere in the Caribbean maybe or somewhere like that. But we're stuck with the term and uh, let's, let's go with that but you can apply it to any building type. It's achievable in any climate. The focus is on the building envelope so, for example, if you get up in the morning and you look out and there's snow on the ground, you're going to dress well. You're going to dress appropriately. You're not going to go out uh, in your underwear and walk around in the snow, you know? So, again, a lot of this is quite common sense. Um, there's a major focus on comfort and indoor air quality. We want good comfort and we want excellent um, air. It demands very high quality construction. So, if there was one word, I suppose, that I could use um, in relation to passive house, it's quality. It's quality of design, quality of detailing, quality of construction, quality of uh, on-site operations. Um, so there's no hiding from the Passive House standard. There's a very good software available, which Berthold and I will demonstrate, um, I think, on the, our third day together, called PHPP. That stands for the Passive House Planning Package, and you have to design it to that. So it's not common Passive House myths. It's only applicable to houses. You can't open the windows. Imagine people look at a window in a passive house, it's got a hinge and it's got a handle, and they ask, can you open this window? I mean, why would it come with a handle if we couldn't open it? In my house, we sleep with the windows open from uh, sort of late March until mid-October, 
and the passive house police don't call around. There's no problem with that. So you can open the windows in the passive house. People think, oh, it must be awful living in an airtight building. Um, in fact, the air quality in the passive house is much better than in a normal house, so that's a, a myth as well. It's not restrictive on aesthetics and it's not too expensive. In fact, in a few years' time, I think we'll be asking ourselves, can we afford not to build to the passive house standard? So they're all false. How do we compare it with LEED? Um, I would describe LEED as a very broad but maybe shallow approach, if that doesn't cause offence. So it covers everything from uh, recyclability of materials, uh, sustainable water, sustainable sites. Um, whereas the passive house, it's focused, it's absolutely obsessed with energy consumption. Okay? Nothing about water, nothing about healthy materials, and they're all important, of course, I recognise that totally. But the focus in passive house and in the EPBD, that's the European Building Performance Directive, the focus is on energy. So these are all the things that we have in LEED, you know them all very, very well. And this is where the passive house uh, standard comes in, if you like. So it's a very strong overlap there. It's, so it's like um, energy and atmosphere on steroids, if you'll allow me to say that. And there's also an overlap with indoor environmental quality because we have a fresh air ventilation system which is bringing in fresh air, only fresh air, not forced air, not recycled air, fresh air 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. We've seen already the evidence from what Dr. Feist has presented. Um, depending on where you go and depending on the, the building standards, the building codes, that number could be 85%, could be 75%, it could be 65%. It really is immaterial uh, what the number is. And we're effectively what we're doing is we're reducing our dependency on imported fossil fuels. Where I come from, 95% of our energy comes in uh, through a pipe or in a boat or some sort of method like that. So we're hugely dependent on imported fossil fuels and we have to try and cut that dependency as best we can. We've seen the analogy already about the flask um, and I think the, the concept is, is very well made and very well presented by Dr. Feist earlier on. If we take um, a typical building, let's say in a, in a cold climate where you need a heating system, the only reason you need a heating system is because there's so much heat loss. If there was no heat loss, you wouldn't need a heating system. That's pretty simple. Um, we have all these losses uh, through uh, drafts, through poor insulation, through glazing and so forth. And um, so we've got all the losses here on the left hand side. We do have some gains, for example, uh, solar gains and internal heat gains, but the rest has to be made up by all this heating system. That's the only reason you need a heating system in your building. And all we try to do with passive house is dramatically reduce those losses. It's very simple. Put on a sweater, put on a windproof jacket, put on another pair of socks, dress appropriately, finish your building appropriately, and now you can see here, th this is in a heating climate where it's cold. Just by having a pulse running through your veins, in other words, you know, if you're alive and well, you're generating a lot of heat. Uh, you can have heat coming in from the sun, and now you've reduced your heat demand very considerably. The same principle is in cooling. We want to reduce the amount of uh, heat gains into the building, so we can, we can do that by insulation as well, by clever shading. Remember those guys 5,000 years ago? They had it totally sorted without any computers or anything like that. And um, be clever about the glass type that you use. So use low solar heat gain coefficient glass, appropriate shading, and you can reduce your, uh, your cooling requirement uh, to a fraction of what it would be ordinarily. Um, you might say, well, you know, if those guys in the Passive House Institute were so smart, how come they didn't totally eliminate the need for heating or the need for cooling. I mean, if you squeeze it down so much, why not just go the whole hog and get rid of it altogether? And the reason for that is based on very sound pragmatics of, of costs. You know, you have this law of diminishing returns. So um, it's sort of very easy to save 20%, and fairly easy to save another, another 20% and so forth, but then it gets more and more and more difficult. So that's why this limit of 4.75 kilobtus per square foot per year is set both for the heat demand and for the cooling demand. And if those numbers uh, don't mean anything, anything to you, it's probably about 10% of what a typical construction standard is. Um, again, a slide may be appropriate for myself. You know, we have all these standards now. We have net zero, we have 
carbon neutral, we have living buildings, we have lead, platinum, gold, silver and all the rest that comes with it. Uh, we have Passive House, we have uh, Briam, we have all sorts of things. So there's 40 shades of green and you'd be dizzy thinking about the whole thing. And it's kind of hard to know where to nail your colours. Um, but the thing I like about the Passive House standard is it's, it's a 20 year old standard. In fact, it's 21 years old. This, that slide is a little bit outdated now. And can you imagine the criteria? Um, you know, uh, when Dr. Feist and his colleagues were thinking up about these criteria 20 years ago, ask yourself, where were you 20 years ago? Most of you were probably in kindergarten. Um, but, you know, 20 years ago, that's, that's uh, depending on your, on your time frame, that's a long time ago or it's a short time ago. But a lot of the criteria are still very valid. So when we talk about uh, windows, we're generally talking about an R value of around seven. This is very climate dependent, of course. So we, we design according to climate. You wouldn't put an R7 window in a location if you didn't need it quite, quite clearly. In terms of solar heat gain coefficient, 0.5 to 0.55. In other words, 55% of the solar energy can get in through the glass. We want very good levels of insulation. Um, if you were to take away an R value uh, today in your head, probably an R value between 35 and 40. Again, very climate dependent, uh, depending on what you need. But that insulation will keep uh, the heat in if you're in a cold climate and keep the heat out if you're in a hot climate. We want to be thermal bridge free and I'm going to give a, a quite a technical presentation I think tomorrow on thermal bridge uh, detailing so we'll say more about that at the time. And we also want it completely airtight. And this is where there's nowhere to hide. The, the, the day of the blow door test, you know when the guy comes, I, I always think it's like the day in the maternity ward. You know, you've been working on this house for nine months and you know the number, you don't know if it's going to be a boy or a girl. Uh, there's a target of 0 0.6 air changes per hour and the guy, is, the guy with the blow door thing is huffing and puffing and he's going, mm, it's not looking great and he's sort of making you all stressful and so forth. And there's nowhere to hide from the air tightness uh, test. And air tightness really costs very little. And there's excellent products available now to achieve that. Um, we also want a good um, ventilation system. We want good indoor air quality. And we must make sure that, those, uh, that equipment that we use is efficient. Because you, when you put equipment in a building, whether it's a house or an apartment or whatever, it's going to be there for 30, 40 years. So put in the very, very best you can. And if you can't afford a good one, put it off for a while until you can put in a good one. So we, we, we want to make sure that we're, we're, we're achieving the best standards. So windows are seven, uh, opaque elements are 35 to 40, and the air tightness, 0 0.6 air changes per hour at 50 pascal. But if you want to talk about the certification numbers, these are, this is, these are the numbers that you have to meet if you want to have your building certified as a passive house. Um, so the heating energy demand and the cooling energy demand is 4.75 kilobtus per square foot per year. The heating load and cooling load 3.17 BTUs per hour per foot squared. The primary energy demand, that's, that number is quite high. And in fact, I would say if any of the numbers should be looked at a little bit critically, there's room for a little bit of wiggle room, I think, for that number. That number is quite high, but the others are still very challenging. Excess temperature frequency. So in passive house, 77 degrees Fahrenheit or over is regarded as overheating, okay? And your building must not go above 77 Fahrenheit for more than 10% of the year. Just, uh, um, and we even try to keep that down to 5%. So if you wanted to uh, sort of direct yourself to one of the key pages in this presentation afterwards, because I know you'll be looking at this tonight in your hotel bedroom, um, that would be the key page there that defines the standard. There's no limits to what can be built. Of course, you can build passive house houses. You can build passive house apartments, office buildings, industrial buildings, schools, factories, churches, and even to the retrofit standard. Um, I've even heard now uh, of a passive house prison. Wouldn't be a bad place to be locked up, I suppose, if you're going to be locked up. Um, you have good air quality and nice comfort and so forth. Um, this passive house factory is quite a clever building. They actually insulated the walls of that factory with the waste uh, wood chip off the floor. And so you can be quite clever uh, as to how you achieve the passive house standard. I want to give you a little bit of a tour of this building here. Um, it's a passive house office building. Um, it's actually nearly 10 years old. That's why I chose it. So they were building to this standard um, 10 years ago. Um, in Germany, those very clever Germans. Very, very clever people, aren't they? Oh, Bertolt. Um, 62,000 square feet 
Uh, the building cost is there, $185 a square foot. And unfortunately, that slide looks amazing on my uh, laptop here if you want to come up and have a look at it, but it gives you a, a schematic. Um, we have a fresh air intake here, and then the fresh air is distributed through this central atrium, and um, so it's a very nice, pleasant environment uh, to, to work. Um, these pipes here are about um, probably the height of the column here, this beam, this concrete beam over our head, and they're about sort of wider than you can hug. And there's a lot of air, fresh air being brought into that building every day. And then the fresh air is delivered through this atrium. It's cooled uh, through the floor slab, so they can actually bring down the temperature overnight by cooling uh, with, under, with the, uh, the cool groundwater. If the temperature outside is 41 Fahrenheit, they need no heating at all. Um, if it's between 23 Fahrenheit and 41 Fahrenheit, it's heated completely for free by the waste heat from the kitchen. And if it goes below 23 Fahrenheit, uh, they need to hook into a district heating system. So very, very efficient there, and I think you'd, be, you'd agree with me on the numbers there. So what about the cost? Uh, conventional offices, about $1.60 per square foot per year to heat and cool, at least that's in, in Germany. Uh, this office is about 30 cent uh, per square foot per year for heating and cooling, so they're saving about $80,000 a year. And this is a beautiful part. The building owner cuts a deal for his tenants, and the tenants think they're doing great out of it. And of course, he's actually making a profit per square foot on the energy that he's selling as well. So everybody's happy. It was built at no extra cost, and so they had payback from day one, and it's fully occupied. And this is very important. So in this whole uh, office complex, uh, there's a very high vacancy rate. You might have heard we have a little recession going on in Europe. I don't, you probably don't have it here. <laughs> and uh, and um, so there's a very, very high vacancy rate now in commercial office buildings. And this building and lots of passive house buildings are fully occupied. So the, um, so the landlords are very happy. Coming to the US, just to show some examples there. This is the first certified passive house school in the US, uh, built in Virginia uh, by a very clever guy called Adam Cohen. And um, it's nice to see some commercial or non-residential buildings coming on the horizon. Teachers love these buildings so much they just can't bear to bring themselves away. <laughs> and if you believe that, you also believe in the fairies. Um, this is a very interesting project in Brooklyn, which I've been to. Uh, this project here is a single family residence. It's a triplex over a shop. And um, I'll be looking at this in a bit more detail, but they, they have this parapet roof here and you might wonder what this light colored band here is, that's aerated concrete, and they use that to cut out the thermal bridges. So normally this is how we build parapet walls. Uh, we have concrete ceiling and concrete walls, and that's, a, that's like a highway for energy, isn't it? For, for heat to escape in the winter time. But what they did was there, they put in a thermal break, this aerated concrete, and completely reduced the heat escaping. So we'll be looking at this in a much more detail I think on Wednesday. In this project in Brooklyn, they also have uh, heating and cooling, of course. They have a very difficult climate to deal with in the wintertime, so they do need active heating and cooling. This is another project uh, due to start fairly soon in Philadelphia uh, by a very clever firm with a quite an unusual name called Onion Flats. And um, they're about to build 130 uh, unit passive house uh, development. So from, I would say, modest beginnings in the US here of single family dwellings, the, the scale of the buildings is on the increase and it's becoming more commercial. How does it all work? Uh, very good envelope, very good windows, thermal bridge free detailing, airtight, compact. We'll have a look at some examples of that now. Um, I mentioned all, already an indicative R value and of course this very much depends on your climate. So you, you take your building design, whether it's a barracks or whether it's a a hospital or a prison or whatever you're designing, you put it into the Passive House Planning Package software and it will um, guide you as a good design tool on what R value you need. And again, to reiterate what Wolfgang Feist said, you can build a Passive House out of pretty much anything you want. If you could get enough tea bags collected and if it was kind of structurally sound, you could even insulate it with that. The material doesn't really matter. It's the insulation value and the quality uh, that kicks into place. We're very spoiled for choice in Europe on the quality of windows, and uh, there are more and more passive house windows now becoming available in the US market. There are some examples at the back of the room here, which you should have a look at. 
And what you'll see with all these windows is they're, they're, they're triple pane. Um, the frames are good and chunky. I think you could describe them. The frames have thermal brakes in them, so they, they have um, insulation. Here, these are vinyl windows, so they have insulated cells. And these are wood windows. They have a, a, a thermal brake in those. And then these are more commercial options down here at the bottom, uh, metal frame windows, which, have, which are, are thermally broken. But, uh, and on, on tomorrow, we'll have a very detailed presentation on windows, how to calculate the performance of windows, and how that all pulls together. Again, this photograph looks astonishing on my laptop here. Um, this is a photograph of my little daughter. She's 11 now, so this photograph is soon after we moved in. And you can see, if you have very good windows, you can, you can live with those kind of windows, even if it's 7, 8 Fahrenheit outside, you can still sit up against those windows in your shirt sleeve with no radiator underneath the window and experience no discomfort. And we'll explain uh, from a building physics, building science point of view, how, how all that comes together. It's very important as well how you fit the window. And um, you, know, you could spend an awful lot of money on good windows, and if you don't fit them correctly, you might as well have bought, bought a, a cheap double glaze unit. So how you fit them is very, very important, and we'll discuss that in some detail tomorrow as well. We'll be talking about psi values. Who here, just again, in order to prepare for tomorrow, who, who here has a good insight into psi values or thermal bridge values? OK, less hands now. OK, good, so I hope I won't bore the socks off you tomorrow. I'll try to put some entertainment in there. Thank you for that. So we have some experts in the room. That's great. Um, we want really, really no numbers. So with, with a psi value, the lower the number, the better. We also, I mean, this is typically a problem in construction where you have the floor slab connecting to the rising wall to the foundation. The building's going to be there for 50 years, 100 years. And if you don't design it correctly, you'll have a huge amount of heat loss in the wintertime, maybe heat gain in the summertime, depending on the design and all sorts of problems. So we want to make sure that our buildings are designed thermal bridge free. We've discussed about ventilation. We want to make sure we've, uh, that our, 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 we spend most of the time in buildings. We're going to be here in this building from 8 o'clock this morning until 5 o'clock this evening. Then we go out for dinner. We'll still be in a building. And then we go to bed, and we'll be in a building, unless you actually get too drunk and you fall outside and you sleep outside in the park. Lovely park out there if you wanted to sleep outside in that. But we're, go we're all going to be in buildings for the next 24 hours. And we need to make sure that we have very good fresh air. And it's not all about the Europeans or the Germans or the Irish. I think the world record, or very close to being the world record anyway, in terms of air tightness, was a very nice project uh, in, in Hudson, up in, in upstate New York. And th the passive house limit is 0.6 air changes per hour, which is, by the way, 20 times the average standard out there on the street. And uh, these guys got it down to 0.16. So four times better than the passive house standard. Very, very good, very good quality construction. Um, we want to make our buildings as compact as possible. And you know, if you get into bed uh, and you're cold, what do you do? You, you intuitively roll up in a ball. You reduce your, your, uh, your volume. Unfortunately, you're not reducing your weight when you're doing that, but you're reducing your, <laughs> you're reducing your surface area. You're stuck with your weight, right? Um, whereas if you get into bed and you're very, very hot, you kind of spread them out like X-Man. And it's the very same in buildings. So we want to make sure that if we can, without constipating architecture and good design, uh, we want to make sure that we build uh, as compact as possible. Uh, we mentioned ventilation systems, um, heat recovery ventilation systems if you're in a cold climate. If you're in a hot climate like this, you, you're talking about energy recovery. Maybe you're trying to take the humidity out of the air. But we have a nice thermographic image here, which shows the cold air coming in here. So the blue, uh, the dark color is cold. So the fresh air is coming in here. Maybe it's 10 degrees Fahrenheit outside. Um, we have return air here from our building, a nice boring 68 degrees Fahrenheit. It's very boring, by the way, to live and work in a passive house, because it's always 68 degrees. Um, but you have the return air coming in at 68 degrees. You have the air coming in f outside, maybe from 10 degrees. And thank you. Love the hat. Um, and so basically, there's no air mixing here at all, by the way. But all that energy from the 68 degrees Fahrenheit air is, is recovered and used to heat the cold air coming in. Very simple principle. And these machines now are up to 92% efficient in many cases. They use almost no power. Uh, they're very, very quiet, very, very silent. I couldn't sleep last night in my hotel room. Uh, the, the noise. Does anybody have a noisy fan in their bathroom? 
I'm sort of nervous of going too close to it in case I get sort of sucked up into it. Uh, you know, the, uh, so, you know, it's high comfort, low noise, low turbulence, and, just, uh, you know, everything should be nicely designed. Don't worry about the numbers on this. I want to focus in on one number here. Um, in terms of fresh air requirement, we're talking about, let's say, 18 cubic feet per person per minute. That's the fresh air that's supplied for a passive house, whether it's um, a school, an office, um, or a, a domestic situation, or a barracks, or whatever military building. So that's the kind of air quality that we're aiming for. We all know about C CO2 levels. So I'd say, I'd say the CO2 level in this room in about another hour will it be probably about 3,000 parts per million. You know, 1,000, uh, people start yawning at 1,000 parts per million. Haven't, oh, there's one yawn. <laughs> so, so 1,000 parts per million is a sort of a cutoff between not great air and okay air, if you like, 1,000 parts per million CO2. And you can see here from the passive houses, a lot of passive houses have been monitored. You do get peaks in CO2, but generally the level is quite good. So the air quality in passive houses, despite the fact that they're airtight, is very good. Uh, Dr. Feist talked about Enerfit. Uh, this is a retrofit standard and uh, has been recently um, introduced. It currently only applies to residential projects, but that'll change. And the heating energy demand is 7.92 kilobtus per square foot per year. Those of you who are paying attention will know that the new build standard is 4.75. So the, those friendly people in the Passive House Institute have been very generous and allowed a relaxation of the heating energy demand. And again, that's on a pragmatic basis. It's hard to retrofit buildings to the Passive House standard. The air tightness is not 0 0.6 air changes per hour as it is for new build. It's 1.0 air changes per hour. That's still very difficult uh, to achieve, but at least it's a little bit more relaxed than what it is for, for new build. Um, something that Joe will talk about at length, and I'm looking forward to learning about that, is you have to prove that there's no moisture problems. We're retrofitting a lot of buildings out there at the moment, and it's, we could be doing untold damage uh, despite our best intentions. We know we want to insulate, we know we want to make it airtight, but do we know what damage we're potentially doing to our buildings? So if you're retrofitting a building to the passive house standard, you must prove that you're not going to cause any moisture problems. Comfortable windows. Remember my daughter sitting against the window in her, in her blouse if it's 10 degrees Fahrenheit outside. That, that's what we mean by comfortable windows. So if you're retrofitting to the passive house standard, we want good glazing. Projects underway in Brooklyn and in Boston. So this stuff is happening on this side of the, of the uh, Atlantic as well. These are some examples of projects uh, that have been retrofitted. You've seen some of them already. Multifamily units here with decentralized ventilation systems, fresh air coming in, exhaust air going out. You can get the principle of that. And again, we're talking about a principle of 85% reduction um, in energy consumption, a huge increase in comfort level. Um, I was in New York uh, two weeks ago giving training there. I was staying in a friend's house and apartment and they have a, what they call a double hung thermostat. Are you familiar with that concept? It was so hot in the building, the only way they have to cool down the building is to open the windows. And if you go out on the street on a cold night, a lot of the windows are open because it's too hot. So when we talk about comfort, it's not only because we're afraid of being cold, but there's actually also people too hot in their buildings. This is nuts. It's obscene to have windows open to, as the only way to cool the building. So we can do a lot better than that. So our, our existing building stock, um, has a very high heating and cooling load, around 32 BTUs per hour foot squared, where the passive house uh, is about 10% of that. What does it all cost? Um, if you buy something good quality, whether it's an item of clothing or whether it's a car, or whether it's a nice meal, you know, in, it's common sense that it's going to cost a little bit more extra. I mean, that's a, it, it's a absurd to think of otherwise. Um, but the cost in Europe is coming down now. In fact, in many cases, projects have been built at nothing extra because the materials are there, the products are there, the technology is there, the tapes, the windows, everything is there. Um, uh, an extensive research project done in, in Europe suggests 8%. A friend of mine in Brooklyn, uh, Sam McAfee, uh, who's partnered, this very short guy there. Maybe you'd wave your hand, Floris. That's Sam's partner. So if you don't believe that number, talk to Floris. Sam McAfee works with um, Floris in that company, 475. 
and their, their experience is they're building passive houses in Brooklyn and New York for nothing extra. Um, Adam Cohen, um, he's the very clever guy who designed a passive house school. Um, his, in his opinion, residential may be 8 to 10% extra and commercial only 4 to 7%. And don't forget, that building is going to be there forever, 50 years, 100 years, comfort, indoor air quality, fuel security, all the buzzwords that we've been thinking about. So things to remember, um, when we talk about passive house, it's not a religion, just to reiterate what Alexander said, um, it's not just houses, there's a big focus on comfort, indoor air quality, it's supported by 20 years of experience and the, the people in the Passive House Institute are the most committed people I've ever met to something, they're very hard working, they absolutely love this concept, it is growing in popularity in the US and it's applicable also to retrofitting. And if you can allow me just two minutes, I have I two minutes? Literally two minutes. So we're here to learn. So now we're going to do a pop quiz, right? So basically, every table from Berthold, if you put up your hand here now, right? So every table from Berthold over is team one, and every table over here is team two, okay? So um, if I could ask the lady at my table there, if you could pick a number here. So pick a number like A1 or C2 or D3 or something like that. B2. Okay, so what I have to do now is escape out of this. So the lady wants B2. What R value would you expect for roofs in passive houses? Okay, so that's to this side of the room. R50. R50 in a cold climate. Everybody happy with that? Could you get away with less? Sorry, you're not on that team. I told you. R50? Okay, are we happy enough with that answer? No. No? Well, I mean, R50 is a very, very high R value. So, uh, in a cold climate, I, I think between R sort of R35 and R40 in most climates will get you by, except if you're sort of building on the Arctic Circle or somewhere like that. Okay, just, this is just for fun. Okay, so give me a number on this side. Don't all shout together. C1, seen them all. Okay, approximately how much energy will a passive house building save compared to normal construction? 85. These guys will be listening. Okay, we'll just do two more questions. Um, I'm looking at the man in the Stetson hat and he has something in his pocket there as well. Um, okay, so give me another number, another lady. Lady there. Yes, you in the blazer. B1? A1. A1. Oh. A1. Okay, name three common passive house myths. Can't open the windows. You can't open the windows, very good. Thanks, Mary. It's only for residential. It's only for residential. That's a myth, yes, one more. It's too expensive, yeah. It's not too expensive, okay. Very good, you guys are very smart, okay. Uh, how are we doing for time, will we do one more? Okay, um, so just give me another one, please. D3, I think you said, okay. So, um, how much extra does it cost to build to the passive house standard? 8%, depending on the, on the project, okay. So, Chairman, I think I'll leave it there, I'm under the guillotine, uh, but we're going to have some pop quizzes during the next day, you have to be wide awake and listening, and if you get the wrong answer, your chair sort of disappears down into the dungeon, dungeon and you have to do the washing up. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over now to my, my dear colleague, Bertolt Kaufmann.